vast wilderness area in the Eastern Cape that is home to some of South Africa's most scenic game reserves. Shamwari, Kwandwe, Amakala, Gora. Names that reverberate with the romance of Africa and names that are fast becoming known to visitors worldwide for the magnificent wildlife experience they offer in a malaria-free setting. It's hard to believe that these tranquil hills were once the arena for a theater of war that spanned a hundred years. Wars between the British and the Amakosa. Getting visitors to the area and to the spirit of the early days of this great frontier region is a reenactment by locals at a cultural village in the Shamwari Game Reserve. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Makina. I'm Zwanle Makina, and I'm your host. And before we get into the village in here, I'd like to give you a brief historical background of the land on which you're standing. This is now the Eastern Cape, the birthplace of Nelson Holishasha Mandela. And this is where the frontier wars were fought between the British forces and the Amakos. You see, the British forces were coming northwards. And when the two different worlds met, then a chapter of fighting opened in the history of this whole area, the frontier wars. This whole area was supposed to be an agricultural area, and that's why elephants, cheetahs, lions, all these were shot and shot. And that's why Shamwari today is bringing back all those predators to roam one more time where they used to roam before. Enough about that. The fiercest battle was fought in Grahamstown. Now Grahamstown is only about 50 kilos from here. And the Amakosa were led by Makata, the left-handed. And as he stood on top of the kopi, encouraging his warriors to come down, his last words were, I will return! Soon, the British were ambushed at what we call a gazini. <laughs> now, before you enter any village, it's very important to make your presence known, otherwise they may think you're enemies. I try and reason with them. Namabantu! Abantu! Ewa! Kobana bo abanabo! Tiambana ndwe ndwe! Kobana bo na! It's becoming impossible. <laughs> <laughs> you love to help me out here. Yes. <laughs> Could you shout your name, please? I am Greg. Uvile. I come from the United States. Oh. <laughs> I'm not sure I <laughs> 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 She's a Shangan woman, that's why the brightly colored material. And of course, she has big bumps. <laughs> this is a Zulu young bride note they had they are given when they get married. And of course, the skirt is made of ox hide. We call it Isidwaba. She's now busy grinding maize into maize meal. The closer one is busy stamping the millis into maize. Now, this is our new man over here. Could you come over here, please? Now, it's the first time his favorite woman is seen by older people. And she's smearing him with red ochre to show that he is a new man. It's only after the stage when he can now approach his mother and ask his mother whether he could have a wife. Now, for the next minute or so, because we've really run out of time, if you'd like to ask questions and take photos of these women, feel free to do that. If you'd like to try your hand in drumming or in the marimbas, feel free. You just go wherever you'd like to do that. Thank you. Come and try your hand here. Yeah? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Shambwari was the first reserve to bring the Big Five back to a region that over 200 years ago had an amazing variety of game. Elephants in particular thrived in the frontier region, but by 1931, through extensive government-funded hunting, there were only 11 left. Now, through the reintroduction efforts of owner Adrian Gardner and his staff, it's possible for visitors to once again see them roaming through the Feinbos vegetation of the Eastern Cape, in much the same way they did in the past. These animals are also comfortable enough to accept newcomers into their territory. This female with a hole in her ear, for instance, was brought in from Nysna in the Western Cape, where the few reintroduced elephants were said to be damaging the forest vegetation. At first thought to be a bull, she turned out to be pregnant. Here she is today, sitting with the, our breeding herd of females, and I, I don't know if you can see her little youngster walking around there with her as well. So it's been quite a success story. But it's not only the elephants that allow for really close viewing. A walk down to Bushman's River will get you quite close to hippos. But be sure to take a game ranger with you, because these animals are dangerous, particularly when out of water. This young giraffe is struggling to get back to its mother from whom it's become separated. You can see that this giraffe is quite nervous at the moment because we've parked here and it's got steep banks on either side of it. It's been split up from the herd, its mother probably. Uh, so it won't actually go up here, especially because of the way that they walk, their pace. They walk with both legs on the same side at the same time simultaneously. They, so there's some horses that do it and for them to get up a steep bank like this is near impossible. So I think what we do is we just back up a little bit and then that'll give us the chance to let him hopefully get back to the herd. The much endangered wild dog that can travel up to 40 kilometers a day when hunting has 20,000 hectares to roam across at Chamwari. They hunt in packs and bring down as much as 85% of their quarry. Although they are less efficient at killing larger prey, and this kudu will live to see another day. A piece of meat from a previous hunt serves as a tasty snack. And while one lucky dog is left to finish off the titbit, the others make sure he's not left behind. On his own, he has little chance of survival, both in feeding and protecting himself. It's as a pack that the strength of these dogs lies, and they know their need to look out for each other. Unlike wild dogs, leopards hunt on their own. Fending for herself in the wilds is this female leopard who lost her mother at a very early age. We've entered her hunting range, and for some unknown reason, she seems to be following our vehicle. Richard has to ensure that she doesn't get too close, as these small animals, who rank just above cheetah in the predatory pecking order, can spring anything from between five and 20 yards away. Two other game vehicles come on the scene, but she ignores them and continues to follow us. Why? It suddenly dawns that what she's after is our microphone, which is covered by a shaggy windshield and which looks every bit like a small animal. She knows it's on the vehicle and she continues to follow us, even though it's now out of sight. For fear of wearing her out, we eventually take leave of the young huntress. On the reserve is a rescue center for big cats, which is managed by Glenn Wiener. Do you know anything about the Born Free Foundation? It was started by the two actors, Virginia McKenna and 
bull drivers in the Bourne film that was filmed in 1966 uh, by releasing Elsa the Lioness back to the wild. Most of the money to create the centre has come from the Julie Ward Memorial Trust. Julie, pictured here with her two brothers, had a love for animals from a very early age. A keen wildlife photographer, she travelled with friends to Kenya's Maasai Mara. But then she went off on her own, which proved to be her undoing, as the charred remnants of her remains were later found in the wilds. It's believed she may have witnessed a poaching by two senior rangers and was subsequently murdered. Her father has spent a fortune in bringing the culprits to book. In an effort to keep Julie's memory alive, her mother, Janet, mounted an exhibition of her photographs in the UK, raising 35,000 pounds, which she gave to Adrian Gardner and Virginia McKenna to create this born free sanctuary for big cats. These are animals, says Glenn, that for one reason or another will never survive in the wilds and will have to live out their lives in a protected environment. Their stories are harrowing. I've got actually three leopards in here, but the one in front we call her, Namira, she's the female. And the two boys are somewhere here, Semi and Elam. They were rescued from Sudan where their mother was killed by poachers and brought to this born free sanctuary at Shamwari. Guys, I mean, while we're walking to, just be careful. Numera is agitated because she's heard the little girl crying and her natural hunting instincts are kicking in. But she'll never be able to leave because she has been hand-reared. And she's also a different subspecies to the South African leopards. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys, now I'm going to try to show you the two lions here. The ones that were rescued from the nightclub in uh, Tenerife. So let's see what we can see up here. They are somewhere here, somewhere underneath these trees. Uh, I think they're having a morning siesta. <laughs> there he is. There's Rafi, just under that guari tree. Can you see him? As cubs, they were used as photographer's props, maybe on a beach or somewhere. And then maybe when they start to scratch people, the previous owner declawed them. And when they got too big, this nightclub owner started to use them to attract tourists to his nightclub. When lions, Anthea is doing it, when they lash the tails, that's a sign of, oh, she's giving a warning. Keep your distance. The black toughy bit that's missing on her tail, uh, she chewed that off. Just a sign of frustration. That cage was about three by two meters. They could take only one pace in any direction. The release into this four acre enclosure must seem like lion heaven after what they've had to endure. Protecting them and all the other animals in the reserve is this large Mother Earth statue in front of the centre, created by the renowned African prophet and writer, Credo Mutwa. Her gaze is eastwards towards new life, and from her shin springs a newborn calf. Further symbols of fertility and fruitfulness are the three breasts and the corn cob, while the skull links her to death and the ancestors. From the owl, she gets her wisdom and the dolphin, her friendliness. Another monument in the reserve is that commemorating Yorkshireman William Folds, who bought the land in 1874. He had a reputation for making the best wagons in the district, and with over 30 wagons a day passing through here at Rotenbach's Drift along the very rough road to settler country, he picked up a lot of trade from repair work. One of his wagons lies in pieces close to his monument. It has survived remarkably well, despite the elements and the fact that it has been squashed by elephants. Even the rhino have used a part of the wreck as a rubbing post. It has become well and truly part of the environment. William Folds made a lot of money from the setup that he had here. And after a while, he exchanged the wagon ride for land on the western bank of the drift we have just crossed through. And that is where Longley Manor was established uh, by him in 1910. Longley Manor has been refurbished over the years and today is just one of the luxury guest lodges for visitors to the reserve, which has become a favourite with the international jet set. <laughs> William's eldest son, William II, 
bought the nearby farm Amakala in 1873, which has remained in the Folds family ever since. Present owner Bill Folds has in his safekeeping one of the wagons made by his great-grandfather. This is reputedly the best wagon he'd ever made and, and decided never to sell it. This instrument I'm holding is an, called an ads and it was used to shape all the woodwork. We employed 20 artisans, trained and employed 20 artisans and I believe he had a waiting list for his wagons and men were prepared to wait for months. William Folds' son, Sidney Barrett, used to do the blooming as they call it, the artwork of the wagons. And there's his name inscribed there and Albany and the date. Like so many farmers in the Eastern Cape, Bill converted his cattle farm into a game farm. And with his sons Grant and William playing an active part in its running and marketing, the Folds family name is destined to continue to make its mark in the frontier region. One of the big attractions at Amakara is the riverboat on the Bushman's River, which makes a large U-bend through the area. If you're a keen birder, this scenic trip will not disappoint as the bird life here is prolific. There's a feast of colorful birds from kingfishers to lorries. Watch out for the fish eagles because no river riverine excursion in Africa is complete without at least one sighting of this majestic bird. If you cast your eye upwards, you may catch a glimpse of Elaweni, a small, rustic, self-catering chalet wedged in a grotto high up on the cliff face. This informal, self-catering facility has sweeping views over the Bushman's River below, which loops around a wide open plateau filled with game, and which, from this perspective, looks every bit like a miniature in Gorogoro Crater. On this fertile plateau with its plentiful supply of water, you are sure to see on a single game drive an incredible variety of antelope. The action isn't all fast moving, so pause along the way to catch up with those in the slow lane and you won't be disappointed. White rhino here allow for close-up viewing. But cows with youngsters can get quite edgy when suddenly surprised. Yeah, she's positioned herself between us and the calf. She's just trying to protect it from any danger that might be um, approaching. The size of the calf means that she's not ready to mate again just yet. Although the male she has in tow seem to believe otherwise. There's another male that's come into the picture here. You can see the male that's been following the female that sat down is actually showing a little bit of submissive behaviour. So that might diffuse the whole situation. A third male comes on the scene which unnerves the cow and she makes a bid to move off but once again with the other two males in tow. With all the water from the surrounding Bushman's River and thick vegetation surrounding the plateau, conditions here are just right for elephants. And Grant says that there was no attempt by any of them to break out when newly translocated, which is quite unusual behavior for these large animals and is a clear indication of how well they have settled in. The 
The mood of reconciliation is played out in a historical cameo scene at the town's cultural village, where the Reverend Richard Gush offers a gift of food to a Kosa chief, and in doing so, saves the people in the 1820 settler village of Salem from attack during the Six Frontier War. Playing the role of the Reverend is one of his descendants, who also goes by the name Richard Gush. From the people of Salem. This church, a national monument in nearby Salem, is where the Reverend Gush served as a pioneer minister. In the Alisdale Cultural Village, the spirit of optimism and hope is celebrated in a praise song to Nelson Mandela, one of the Eastern Cape's most illustrious sons. Another private game reserve which occupies converted farmland, more than 20,000 hectares, is Kwandwe, in the vicinity of the Great Fish River, a locality which saw much fighting during the frontier wars. During this conflict, there were elephants here. It is said that prior to the arrival of most of the settlers here, this valley probably had one of the highest concentrations of elephants in Africa. The terrain and the vegetation here is well suited to supporting elephants. And not only that, we have leopard, lion, all the big animals that are now being reintroduced into this area existed here at that time. Fort Wilshire was established in 1819. Soon after that, in the 1820s, just after the arrival of the settlers here, it is said that in one year, 55,000 pounds of ivory was traded through Fort Wilshire. That can give you some sort of indication of the concentration of wild animals that we had in this area. The reintroduction of all these animals means that the area is fast returning to what it looked like in those early pre-settler days. You know, every now and then you get a breeding herd sighting. Elephants, and it just worked out perfectly. Coming up this, up this hill, right in front of us, each and every one, two females breeding herd. They can be a little bit um, more sensitive, but um, just absolutely perfect. I don't know if you've noticed how they all put up their trunks trying to smell us. But you'll see in the elephant bulls, the elephant bulls normally shake their head like this and you see their ears flapping. It's just a bit of a sign of like a bit of annoyance. Elephants in this region just love eating aloes. So much so that, according to Mac, they have totally transformed the landscape. If you read in the historical journals, then you'll see that it was mentioned that aloes in this part of the world were only found on very steep, rocky uh, slopes. So when the elephants disappeared, the aloes just said, fantastic, you know. Here's our niche, here we can, we can just grow. So aloes occurring out here in the open never used to be like this. So the elephants are just telling us a story and say, you know, we're just kind of destroying everything back to what it, what it used to be like. Just as too many elephants can impact on the natural vegetation, 
So too many predators can take out too much game and their numbers have to be carefully monitored. For this very reason, the brother of this sub-adult lioness has been taken to another reserve. And as these are sociable animals who hunt together, she is trying to bond with an older female, who in turn is showing the younger one that this is her turf by marking her territory. We just don't get to see these females doing territorial marking very often. Obviously it would be the male that does most of the territorial marking. He would be the guy going out on patrols and making sure there's no other potential pride males coming into the territory. The older lioness moves away and the sub-adult is trying to make contact with her through these small vocalized calls. The calls alert a passing kudu of impending danger. Strangely, he makes no attempt to run away, but holds his position. What the kudu is doing is it's alarm calling. And that kudu knows exactly at that distance it's perfectly safe. Lions need that element of surprise. Once the lion hears that alarm call, that bark, it almost sounds like a dog barking, um, the lion will just give up all attempts of hunting. The more important thing over here is, th is that the kudu wants to keep the lion in sight so the kudu knows where the lion is. The lioness is not interested in the kudu. Instinctively she knows she needs to be accepted into the resident pride and that is her main preoccupation at the moment. If she was trying to hunt, she would have lowered her whole profile. You could have seen, she would have seen she would have gone into a stalking uh, posture. At the moment she's just walking towards the kudu. Tracks of the pride mile mobile in a southerly direction down Boma Road. Later on that afternoon we come across the resident male. There's a line. There's a line. Okay, we've got the pride man. A beautiful animal, unscarred and handsome the proverbial Lion King. With evening drawing close, he starts advertising his presence and making contact with lionesses in his territory. He's about seven years old now. He's in excellent condition. As the sun begins to set, it's time for him to move on. Do you see the size of that, those paws, the size of that chest? It's just absolute strength. The strengths of these animals are just absolutely amazing. We soon lose sight of him, but Mac later picks up his tracks. Doc. Nice fresh lion tracks. The lion is now mobile in a southerly direction along Boma Road. There he is, looking every bit like a termite mound on the open felt.
As the sun sets, the roars become louder. Only now there is a plaintive reply. Coming, no doubt, says Mac, from the young lioness we left not far away. He says it won't be long before she has reached Estrus, and this resident lion could well be the future father of her cubs. If not, she could team up with a nomadic lion on the eastern side of the reserve. Which all goes to show that life is tough out here in the wilds, not only for the prey, but also for the predators. Evening brings with it a whole array of small animals, which are special to this region. Looking like a miniature striped hyena is the odd wolf. This one is sniffing out termites on dry grass, which it will spend its night collecting and taking to its burrow. Brilliant sighting of an art wolf. So many of these guests come to these game reserves and they don't even know about this animal, the art wolf. Uh, we all know about the art fact, the guy that digs these big holes in the ground, but when you show them an art wolf, they're just completely oblivious to the existence of this animal. He's actually marking his territory. These animals' territory will more or less depend on the density of termite mounds. The more termite mounds, the smaller the territory, and obviously the less, the larger the territory. Another night hunter is the bat-eared fox, which spends early evening in social activity. Afterwards, it will forage for small creatures like lizards and mice, as well as termites, well into the early hours of the morning. Look out for a rustle in the bush, which is a sure indicator of the rarely seen porcupine. Of the smaller animals, rabbits and black-backed jackals can also be seen during the day when you may be lucky enough to catch a glimpse of the endearing meerkats, all of which are endemic to this semi-arid region. The wide open grasslands of Kwanwe allow for excellent viewing of plains game, and ostriches are also common here a reminder that this location was once a very productive ostrich farm run by ex-British sea captain Arthur Douglas, who bought the land and farmhouse in the 1870s. He was a world pioneer in the use of incubation for speeding up the hatching of ostrich eggs and led an opulent life during the heyday of the ostrich feather industry, which, during these boom times, fetched one pound sterling for one pound in weight of feathers. Arthur Douglas is buried on the farm with his beloved horse, together with his family and his descendants. And the farmhouse is now the reception area for guests arriving at Kwanwe. The house, Heatherton Towers, is said to be haunted. A light is left on at night, but no one will sleep there. Adding to the ghostly atmosphere is the dark phantom shape of this lone elephant bull hovering in the grounds at nightfall. Another famous farmhouse in the frontier region is this magnificent homestead which belonged to the farm Gora, now part of the Greater National Edo Elephant Park. It's been lovingly restored by the Hunter family, who have a special concession to run a private lodge in the National Park. Guests are housed in these luxury tents around which wild animals roam freely and at night they are plunged into the deeps of dark Africa by a cacophony of sounds. <laughs> the farmhouse is where guests are entertained in an atmosphere reminiscent of the early colonial days.
Christopher Mark, a previous owner who is hailed as the matriarch of Gora, must feel quite at home here, because guests taking pictures of the interior have reported on more than one occasion capturing her image. As dawn breaks on our first morning, we set out to find the grave of this legendary figure. The landscape is blanketed in a heavy mist, and a herd of buffalo, their shapes barely visible in the early morning light, look like the ghosts of all those hordes of buffalo that were hunted down in the 1920s to clear the way for agriculture. That's a very peaceful aura. At last, we come upon Hester's grave. On this headstone is her two husbands as well, which were buried on the side here. Henry Ernest Attrell was, was actually killed by an elephant down in the gorge here. There is a, a very interesting Hottentot legend uh, that goes with the graves of, of people who are killed by elephants, that the elephants will come back and dig up the bones and make peace with the situation. Now, when we found this grave here, uh, building the Gore Elephant Camp, the graves were largely decimated, and it is thought that perhaps the elephants have come in and scattered the bones, making peace with the situation. We also find uh, a lot of the times uh, the elephants bring the bones of other animals around here. We don't know if that is, is a coincidence or if that perhaps ties in with the legend. We leave that to you to believe. One unsavory character that stands out in Gora history is Major Pretorius, a man with a big ego and a reputation as a ruthless hunter who was commissioned in 1919 to rid the area of wildlife. Two years later, there were only 16 elephants, 30-odd buffalo, a few predators and plains game left. Ten years after this, a world outcry at the wanton slaughter led to the creation of the Addo Elephant Park to save the remaining elephants. By the time that they had proclaimed the sanctuary, Graham Armstrong was one of the rangers and it was he that designed this fence here. Uh, it was his belief that the only fence that would really keep the elephants in was a, a railway fence. So he got the old tram lines from Port Elizabeth and these are old lift cables and mining cables that he's combined with that. Each tram line there is buried two meters deep into the ground and it takes about eight men to lift it, so it's extremely strong. And they're still erecting it today uh, on the new sections of the park. But the elephants here seem to be so content that one wonders if they will ever want to try and get out. They have 180,000 hectares to roam in and Addo is being extended right down to the coast, which means that elephants could one day be seen on the beach. A far cry from those early days when redcoats paced their horses up and down the sands. Another reason for them to stay around is the plentiful supply of sweet water. The name Gora, in fact, gets its name from the Bushman word for fresh water. Elephants love fresh water, and there's always a plentiful supply at this pan, which is serviced by clean water piped in from another part of the reserve. Which is just as well, because the number of other visitors coming here have no manners. Plunging right in and turning the water into a muddy pool, despite the efforts of the youngsters to keep them at bay. Forest of trunks serve as giant straws to slurp up the fresh pipe water, with cows and calves making way for the bigger bulls.
Although sometimes it all gets too much for a cough. <laughs> Close by lies the carcass of an elephant bull. Judging from the, the hole in his, it, the shoulder, it was uh, quite a few years ago, but uh, we noticed in the, the decaying stages of the, the carcass how the different elephants would come and react to, to the bones. Here are some of these age-old implements I was telling you about. Uh, these tools date back to the early Stone Age, which is about 250,000 years ago, maybe more. This is a typical hand axe, which would simply be held in the palm of the hand and then used to cut off meat or, or skin the animals. But the reason we can tell it belongs to the early Stone Age era is the size of the tool. As it went into the Middle Stone Age and then the later Stone Age, the tools got smaller with time. This particular tool over here worked in two components. It's called a grindstone, and this would be held simply between the knees, and then there would be a smaller pebble with a flat end, which would be used to, to grind either meat, vegetables, or seeds. Right next to the homestead is another pan. So, if you just want to sit and relax and watch the passing show, it's all laid on for you. And if you look hard enough, you'll see all kinds of everyday dramas being played out. This baby warthog, for instance, has lost its mother and is desperately trying to join up with any other warthogs. But with very little success. Wish mother could have been taken by a predator. Oh, look, now he's trying to join up with the other family. That female's got two siblings over there, but she probably won't accept him either. If he's going to be a lonely little warthog, he's going to be pretty vulnerable out there. The next morning, we go in search of the youngster, fully expecting to find his carcass. But instead, come across one very happy little pig, united once more with his mother. It's difficult to say who is more delighted at the happy reunion, the mother or the baby. One thing is for sure, he's not going to wander away from his mother again in a hurry. He's very lucky to be alive with all the predators that roam around here at night. The introduction of predators into the reserve has brought out a whole range of new protective feeding habits amongst the playings game. That cuddy over there, you see how it's captured their attention. And now all of a sudden the hartebeest and the zebra have stopped feeding. The zebra in the center will often benefit from the hartebeest being a lot more aware and they continually feeding within the safety circle of the hartebeest. And if anything had to disturb the hartebeest, that would trigger off a signal to the zebra to run with them as a sort of safety mechanism. But it's not always predators that herald the end of the plains game. Continual grazing over the years wears down their teeth, and when their teeth go, they can die of hunger as in the case of this poor animal who is at the point of no return. The cycle of life and death is played out every day here, and while one animal is put out of its misery, a young bachelor herd celebrates life in a show of frisky play. Now this is an unusual sight. A black rhino grazing on an open plain. With their specially adapted prehensile lip, these animals are usually browsers.
it's a very unusual habit. It's, it's not a very common thing to um, pick up on. And uh, research has shown that a lot of the rhino's habits are focused around grazing here. Feeding off Scottish thistle. Whereas if you compare them with the habits of other black rhino, they tend to spend a fair portion of their time um, in the thickets browsing a lot. He's very much aware of us and seems to resent our presence. Spraying is the animal's way of forming a barrier, just letting us know that he doesn't want us to go any further. We don't have time to heed the warning. Not too long afterwards, we see the same rhino in a quieter mood, tentatively moving in on the watering hole next to the homestead. After his former show of aggression, we feel very privileged that he is now trusting us when he is at his most vulnerable. It's a very special moment for us, just one of many in a very special area of the Eastern Cape. There's an aura about Gora, an aura that permeates this entire region with its brilliant sunrises and sunsets, its unique flora and spectacular game viewing combined with a tangible sense of history that has been carefully preserved in every one of the reserves we visited in this wild about excursion into the great frontier. <laughs>